Hi guys, so I'm here today with what is quite a large book haul, so I'm just going to jump straight into the books. So the first two books I have to show you I picked up when I was visiting Edinburgh and seeing family and I went to the bookshop with my friend Jill, as always, <laughs> and picked up a couple of books. The first one is technically a present from my mother, <laughs> as um, she gave me some money to buy a book. And I got The Great God Pan and Other Horror Stories by Arthur Mackin. You might be able to read the title easier that way. Um, these are the gorgeous new Oxford University Press classics range. Um, they published a few different books in this. I think I actually hauled the Sense and Sensibility um, edition of these a while back. And I have been meaning to read The Great God Pan for ages. It is a classic horror novella with hints of Greek mythology in there. It's in part inspired by like classical themes and classical characters. I mean, it's the great god Pan, after all, he is a ancient Greek god. And I just, because of that, and I also quite enjoy a sort of classic creepy horror story, I have wanted to read this for ages. And this actually contains a few of Arthur Mackin's different um, sh horror stories. So we actually have tons of other short stories or novellas, um, depending on the length, I don't know <laughs> what you categorise them as in, in here. Um, some of which are actually longer than The Great God Pan. I guess The Great God Pan is just the most famous one, that's why it's in the title. Um, but yeah, tons in here. So I'm really excited to finally be reading some Arthur Mackin because he's just been on my list of authors to read for a while. The stories themselves originally came out in the late 18 and early 1900s. But for my second purchase with Jill, we both got this book actually and we got it in a three for two and that is The Light of Truth by Ida B. Wells. This is the Penguin Classics edition, um, Writings of an Anti-Lynching Crusader. I've again been meaning to read Ida B. Wells for quite a while. She's an author that um, I believe I was referenced in some Angela Davis books I was reading, perhaps some Audre Lorde as well. She was a black woman living in the United States of America and she campaigned against um, racial hatred, like, well, as the title suggests there. And this is before the sort of civil rights movement era of like Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King that we learn about in school. She is writing in the late 1800s again, similar time period we have here. And yeah, it's just a selection of sort of non-fiction essays. Some of these are literally like a page long and others are much, much longer than that. So they may originally have been published as like pamphlets in different formats, but they're her various writings on um, the topic of um, racial hatred and racism and, and what was going on in the time that Ida B. Wells was living in. The next book is actually more of a loan. <laughs> I borrowed this book from my mum, but I thought I'd mention it as I'm reading it soon, and that is Brick Lane by Monica Ali. I am reading this for the Feminist Orchestra Book Club, which is a book club I started and now run with Lauren over at Reads and Daydreams. If you didn't see, we announced the entire reading list for 2018 a few weeks ago and our second book, the book we will be reading in the months of May and June as we take two months for each book now, is Monica Ali's Brick Lane and my mum had a copy so I thought great I don't have to seek that out somewhere else I'm going to borrow hers and she has read this it came out back in 2003 and it's about an immigrant woman's experience living in London. Our protagonist originally moves from Bangladesh to London um, for an arranged marriage and it's um, just about her life and what happens after she moves here and her experiences and yeah it got tons of praise when it originally came out and I'm really excited to read and discuss it together. So yeah if you are even vaguely interested in this one maybe join in on the discussion in the book club. I will of course link the video down below. I then have a book that should have been in my last book haul but I completely forgot to include it because it was in my bed where I'd been reading it and I've now finished it and that is Circe by Madeline Miller. This is a proof edition. It doesn't come out until April but it's published by Bloomsbury and just get excited, guys, because this is an amazing book. I have already read and finished it, like I mentioned, and I gave it five out of five stars. I loved it. It's the first of Madeline Miller's books I've read. She also wrote a book called Song of Achilles, which is based on the Achilles Patroclus myth, which I haven't read. This, however, is based on the myth of Circe, who was a witch slash sorceress, who was the daughter of the Titan Helios, so she was also a goddess. And this follows her entire life essentially. Um, it brings all of the different myths involving Circe together and creates a linear narrative including one of her most famous episodes which is when Odysseus stays with her during his travels back from the Trojan War in the Odyssey. But that is not 
the main crux of the story. That is just one part of her entire life and it was such a pleasure to read this book. I think Madeline Miller did a spectacular job bringing Cersei to life and characterising her obviously in a way that the author felt she wanted to characterise her um, but I just thought it all, all came together beautifully and um, yeah, loved this one. I then have a book that was given to me as a gift by Simon over at Savage Reads. This was for my Christmas and it is Witchborn by Nicholas Bowling. Now, you might have noticed in um, 2017 that I was reading a lot of witchy books. I really got into my witchy books. Um, I'd read witchy books in the past and enjoyed them but I, I went for quite a witchy binge um, and Simon took note of that and bought me a new witchy book to try out which I'm super excited for. I'm going to read you the back because it's not a book I'd heard of before he gifted it to me which is one of the nicest kind of books to be gifted I think. Alice is in Bedlam Asylum, mad they say. Her mother has been executed for witchcraft, her home destroyed and her spirit crushed. So maybe it's true. Or maybe she isn't as broken as she seems. A visit from two masked strangers provides an opportunity to, to escape and Alice takes it. Now she must navigate the dark streets of London where there's a secret waiting to be unravelled. In an England divided by rival queens, it seems Alice has a part to play. If only she can master the rising power within her. I assume that means she is a witch from that, that, second, that last sentence. But obviously there's more going on here, it's a bit of historical fiction. I'm also hoping from the idea on the back that it perhaps plays on that idea of the mad women and the way women were kind of persecuted. Um, back in the day. <laughs> so I think a lot of themes in here that sound really really up my street and I'm really grateful to Simon for this one. On the topic of witches however I was also sent a proof of another book which deals with witches that I'm obviously excited for and that is The Lost Witch by Melvin Burgess. So I was actually on a panel with Melvin Burgess and Non Pratt in the summer of 2017. They were both absolutely lovely people and I don't know about you but I find meeting people makes me all the more excited to read their work. So I know that Melvin Burgess has had quite a big influence on the YA genre. He's been writing it for a few decades now and this is his new novel which doesn't come out until August. I am sorry to be hauling it now and um, hopefully I will read it before then and can give you my thoughts in anticipation of its release. This one follows B, who has started hearing voices and these voices are telling her that she's a witch but her parents naturally think she's hallucinating and it's about what happens uh, concerning all of that, you know, witchcraft, witchy books, witchy books. I'm, I'm so down for the witchy books. I then have two more books I did buy for myself and I bought both of these from Bookmarks Bookshop in London which is one of my favourite bookshops. If you're looking for it, it's near Tottenham Court Road and the British Museum and it's just brilliant. It's been one of my favourite bookshops in London since I was a kid and um, one of my mum's friends used to work there um, and we visited when I was a kid so it's, it's a bookshop that I very much love and always find new things in. So the two books I picked up are The Essential Rosa Luxemburg, Reform or Revolution and The Mass Strike. These are two essays by Rosa Luxemburg published by Haymarket Books. Rosa Luxemburg was writing in the late 18, early 1900s again. That seems to be like a very prominent time period in these books. But she was a left-wing academic and activist during this time and she's somebody I greatly admire. I started reading her work in 2017 again and I'm really excited to read more by her. She is a phenomenal writer, she throws so much academic shade, she's so sassy, she completely understands the value of accessibility in non-fiction and politics and in the book I read by her, uh, What is Economics, she completely tore apart um, other academics for lack of clarity so I just think she's brilliant and I very much admire her so can't wait to read more by her. I then also picked up this book from Verso's Radical Thinkers series and that is Women, Resistance and Revolution, A History of Women and Revolution in the Modern World by Sheila Robotham. Sheila Robotham is I believe quite a well known feminist writer and thinker of sort of the 1970s time period. Um, she's an author my mum's always recommending to me and I just haven't gotten around to reading yet but this, this can be my in I think. Although after buying this I then found out my mum actually owns a copy. I don't know why it didn't occur to me that she might, but I got totally sucked in in the bookshop, particularly because of the video I made recently on Goodnight Stories for Rebel Girls, which was a book I had a lot of issues with. And I discussed generally sort of what we're looking for in inspirational female figures and groups and political activists and what we find inspiring and how we value power perhaps too readily 
this book, when I just read it, the back and the front just sounded like a bit of a alternative to that. Obviously, this is an adult book, it's not aimed at a younger generation, but this almost seemed to be offering me exactly what I wanted. It says on the back, this classic book provides a historical overview of feminist strands among the modern revolutionary movements of Russia, China and the Third World. Sheila Robotham shows how women rose against the dual challenges of an unjust state system and social sexual prejudice. Women, Resistance and Revolution is an invaluable historical study, as well as a trove of anecdote and example fit to inspire today's generation of feminist thinkers and activists. That's exactly what I want and need, so hopefully it lives up to all of that. <laughs> Moving on to more books I was sent by the publishers. The first one I was sent by Canning Gate after I requested it because I really wanted to read it. You'll have seen it perhaps in my most anticipated releases of 2018 video and that is The Book of Joan by Lydia Yuknovich. This is a science fiction novel inspired by Joan of Arc, so it's set in a futuristic setting with a sort of Joan of Arc central character. It's a dystopian world that is ravaged by war and hatred and a group have come together in order to try and save the world. <laughs> a group led, of course, by Joan. So I've heard amazing things about this one. I think it came out a while ago in the US, so I've already read quite a few reviews and yeah, I think this is going to be wonderful. I was then sent three absolutely stunning books by Vintage. They are their beautiful black and red series of dystopian classics. So first we have Aldous Huxley's Brave New World which I haven't read and I think this is quite a early dystopian novel quite pivotal to the development of the genre. It says far in the future the world controllers have created the ideal society through genetic engineering, brainwashing and recreational sex and drugs all its members are happy consumers. Bernard Marx seems alone in feeling discontent, harbouring an ill-defined longing to break free, a visit to one of the few remaining savage reservations where the old imperfect lifestyle continues, maybe the cure for his distress. And secondly, one that I mentioned that I wanted to read in my classics, I specifically want to read in 2018, so I'm glad to have a copy, is 1984 by George Orwell, a book that I actually believe has in part a lot of influence from Brave New World. I'm, I'm sure I've read that Brave New World influenced 1984. You've probably heard of 1984, it's set in the futuristic 1984, as this book was written prior to that year, in which uh, we all live in a sort of big brother type state and surveillance is very, very heavy um, and it's about, again, one man sort of breaking free of that dystopian and brainwashing that he's been um, living in. And lastly, a book I've actually already read, but the third in the series, and that is The Handmaid's Tale by Margaret Atwood. Again, this one is a dystopian novel. This one heavily deals with women's rights and reproductive rights and is set in a world in which not a lot of people can bear children anymore. Fertility has gone way, way, way down. So this new structure has been put in place where uh, women handmaidens are um, sort of lent out to different families in the hopes that these upper class families can then bear children through them. Another book that I'm incredibly, incredibly grateful to the publishers for sending me is the new translation of Homer's Odyssey by Emily Wilson, published by Norton, and I am so excited to read this. The Odyssey is one of those books that so many people have an early introduction to ancient literature through and I completely understand why. It is a wonderful story, it's incredibly engaging, Homer's writing uh, conjures really vivid images in your mind and it's a book I started with early on. It's a book my dad loved and um, shared with me and um, I have his, his, his edition in my room. But what makes this translation all the more special is that unlike the majority of translations available in the English language, it is translated by a woman and that has made a difference because she has come at it from a new perspective and she has tried to break down generations of preconceptions surrounding this book that has influenced the translators before her. So it's really interesting, you can read some of the comparisons say on her Twitter that she's shared but a lot of the language she has translated in a very accurate way paints the characters, particularly the female characters, quite differently from a lot of the traditional translations by men. And Emily Wilson is trying to break down these prejudices and create a new translation for a new generation, a new exploration um, of this work. And of course it will be really interesting having never read 
this translation and not having read most of the Odyssey in the original language for me to compare my previous experience to the Odyssey with this new translation. It's had a lot of praise from scholars I admire like Daisy Dunn and Tim Whitmarsh so I have full faith that this is going to be an amazing, amazing translation. I know we've been here a while but let's keep going. The next book is actually a book I picked up from Pan Macmillan before Christmas and again I completely forgot to include in a haul before now but it is The Darkening Age, The Christian Destruction of the Classical World by Catherine Nixie. This is a non-fiction book about the impact the rise of Christianity had on um, classical culture and the survival of different elements of classical culture and um, artifacts, which as a classical scholar is something I'm very interested in. We then have another book I was sent and that's It's Always the Husband by Michelle Campbell, unless it's the best friend <laughs> is the subheading there. This is a thriller novel, love me a thriller, really intrigued by this one. I've seen it compared to The Secret History and Big Little Lies, which are two things I'm a big fan of. So I'm hoping that it lives up to that hype. It's about three friends from college whose lives have taken various paths over the years, but now one of them has died and suspicion falls upon um, the the people in the group. Was it the husband? Was it one of the friends? And I'm, I'm incredibly intrigued to find out. And also from Hockey Books we have a proof copy of Love, Hate and Other Filters by Samira Ahmed. This one is a young adult romance novel but it also deals with um, racism towards Muslim characters. Our central character is Muslim and um, yeah sort of hate towards Muslims in America so I think that's a really interesting combination of things and I love to see important themes like that incorporated into young adult literature so I have really high hopes for this one. And lastly I have three little books to show you and it is these three books from Penguin Classics. Now I actually have 13 of these books. I recently did a video for Penguin Classics all about these new Penguin Modern books and I picked 10 by authors that I really highly recommended to share with you in that video but they also sent me three more to try so these are authors I have not tried and each of these books is a pound so it's a great great introduction to new modern classic works that you haven't before experienced and I have Daydream and Drunkenness of a Young Lady by Clarice Lispector. I've already read one of the short stories in this one but it says three intoxicating tales of three women, their secret desires, fears and madness from a giant of Brazilian literature. We then have an advertisement for toothpaste by Rizard Kapuczynski. This one says, The great traveller reporter finds an even stranger and more exotic society in his own home of post-war Poland than any of the distant lands he has visited. Gotta love a bit of Polish literature there. And then we have of Dogs and Walls by Yuko Tsushima. And this one says, Two luminous, tender stories from one of Japan's greatest 20th century writers, showing how childhood memories, dreams and fleeting encounters shape our lives. So I'd really like to know if you've read any of these three authors and would recommend them to me and perhaps which one I should prioritise. I've got to say I have a bit of a soft spot for Polish literature, having Polish family and one of my surnames being Polish. Um, so I might go for that but I would love to hear if you've read those authors and would recommend them because there's such a wide array in the 50 classics in that range that I'm really interested to experience some new people that I might never have read otherwise. But yes, those are all the books. Can you believe it? The haul is over. I know this was epically long and I do apologise if that's not your cup of tea but if you, like me, love a good long book haul then I'm glad we could experience this together. And uh, if you have read any of these books or are interested in reading any of these books, I would love to hear your thoughts in the comments down below, so please do leave them. But until next time, guys, happy reading, and I'll see you all again soon. Bye.